So this is lecture seven, our final lecture for ELEC 352, where we'll be looking at cost management. We'll be finishing our discussion of cost management. We'll be talking about different types of costing and different types of cost analysis. So we are now at the very end of our um, module. This is the final lecture. By now, you will have done most of the coursework. So these, you should have received your marks for these. You should be working on task three. You should have done the careers and employability activities. And you should be preparing for your final class test in the new year. Now, I've received a little bit of feedback about um, the delivery of this module, so thank you for everyone who's contributed. One thing that um, quite a few people said was, could I speak faster? So the lectures are dragging on a little, so I'm going to try to increase the pace slightly. That might mean a little less explanation, and I'll gloss over some of the, um, the numerical examples. I'll give you time to... Um, to to go through these at your own pace. So just as a reminder, it seems like uh, many weeks ago, this is when we spoke about different types of cost and we introduced the idea of overhead absorption, OAR, overhead absorption rates. We introduced something called the payback period, the discounted cash flow and net present value as a way to look at how our currency, how our how our money, how the funding for our project will change its value over time. Today, we're going to look at labour costing. So we've spoken about labour costing before. We didn't give any details. We're going to talk about different ways of costing our labour. So we're going to look at costing methods, how decisions are made. We're going to distinguish between fixed and variable costs. And we're going to speak about the two main costing models that use these fixed and variable costs. We'll introduce something called a break-even point and comment on how special order contracts should or should not be fulfilled. So just as a quick reminder, you've seen this slide a few times before for some business that has direct costs and indirect costs. And we add the direct costs together, we call them the prime costs and the indirect costs, we call the overheads. So we've spoken about this distinction uh, before. Whenever we spoke about labour, so here we have direct labour and here we have our labour cost, but we never explained how this labour cost is actually calculated. Today we're going to go into that in some detail. So we're going to be looking at labour costing methods. <clears throat> so labour comes under something called direct cost. So if you go back to the example here, you've got direct labour costs here and indirect labour costs here. So we're interested in the um, application to um, labour as a direct cost. So how do you cost the labour involved in producing something? You can either have a flat rate, an hourly rate, this is how much it costs to employ the staff, or we can have a cost associated with each item that is produced. Okay, so it's either um, production of each cost unit or each item, or it's based on um, uh, the flat rate. Now, why is it important to uh, distinguish between the two? As you'll see, in order to determine the profit of an item, we need to find the cost, and the cost will be different depending on how we calculate it. So just <clears throat> to distinguish these two, the flat rate model and the piecework model. So in a flat rate model, everyone is paid a flat rate per hour, independent 
on how many units are produced. It doesn't matter how many items a person produces. What matters is when they clocked in, when they clocked out. So it's all a function of time. Whereas in piecework, you're not paid for your time, you're paid for how much you've actually achieved. Okay, and um, within this piecework model, we distinguish between straight and differential um, uh, costing. And we'll, we'll give a, a, an example of each in a second. So as an example of straight piecework, say you have a laborer, someone operating a machine, and they are paid at a rate of £1.80 for every 100 components that they make. Okay, so that's a flat rate per item. So it's um, £1.80 for every 100 units produced. So if you divide the 180 by 100, that's how much the person is paid per unit that they're produced. So for example, if this person produces that many units in a week, of which 60 are rejected, that means that what this person is paid for is 9140 minus 60. That's what they're paid for. And they're paid at a rate of pound eighty for every 100. So that is called the weekly labour cost. Weekly because we mentioned here week. So that's the cost per week. And if you calculate that, that'll give you 163.44. So that's a simple example of straight piecework question. By, what we mean by straight is that all the items this person produces are the same. So these um, 100 components, these are all identical. Okay, so this is just that calculation explained. <coughs> Now, when we speak about uh, differential piecework, this is where you have different items. In this case, we've got A, B, and C. And the different items take different amounts of time to make. So therefore, it wouldn't be fair to have a fixed, um, a fixed cost <coughs> per item, because clearly, Component C takes more time to make than component A. <clears throat> so, in this case, what we're actually going to do is pay our labourer at a rate of 10p per minute. So it depends on how much time this person is spending making these items. So it's per unit, per minute of production, not per hour on the job. So we're not paying them per hour. We're not saying, well, you clocked in at eight o'clock, clocked out at five o'clock, we're going to pay you for that time. No, what we're going to do is count how many units were produced, multiply each one by the amount of time that took, and then multiply that by your labor cost rate. So that's how much this labourer would cost us. This is how much we would pay the labourer. Another example. I'll leave you th this one for you to do. So again, we're given different amounts of time allowed for each of these components, A, B and C and we're pay she's paid at 17 pence per minute. And that's only for production minutes. These are the minutes made in producing these components of A, B, and C. But she has a maximum of 37 hours a week. So she can keep her, her, her pay can increase as she produces more items, but she cannot exceed 37 hours per week. So if in a given week, she makes 440 of A, 
506 C of B, 610 of C, what are her earnings for the week? So we can calculate that really easily. You just need to multiply each of these numbers by the corresponding um, times. Check if it's less than 37 and then multiply by 17p. So if you do the maths, the answer is 37740. So this was an example of differential piecework where items, um, depending on what exactly it is they're making, will take more or less time. So now let's look at costing methods. Now, I'm not going to read through this. I'll, I'll let you do that. But I want to make a distinction between something called order costing and continuous costing. So for order costing, what we're doing is we're dealing with separate jobs or contracts. And you often come across these terms, job costing, batch costing, and contract costing. And what we're doing is assigning a job or assigning a cost for an entire job or a batch or a contract. So when we talk about the profit or the loss, we're talking about the whole contract. So this contract came at a cost of so much and had a, a profit or a loss associated with it. With every, um, with every order such as this, we have something called job card, and that records certain pieces of information, as we'll see in the uh, examples in the next few slides. Usually at the bottom of one of these job cards, there is a share of the overhead written. So remember when we spoke about um, overhead absorption rates? And we spoke about how um, overhead for non-production centers um, can be incorporated as a percentage of the production cost. Well, you'll see an example of how that often appears. So the other type of, um, or another type of costing is batch costing where what we're producing is a number of identical products. So we're producing a large batch of identical products. So if we want to know the total cost per unit, rather than looking at the individual components that go into it, what we look at is the total cost of the whole batch and then simply we divide it by the number of units. Okay, so we divide the total batch by the number of units. That will tell us what the cost of each unit was. So we do that where we have a large number of identical items that we're producing. So for example, this is an example of a, uh, a job card. You have a job number. You have the quantity here. So that's it quantity. You're given a sale price of £45 per unit. And there are different costs. So that's your direct material cost. And here you have your different um, uh, production cost centers and your different OARs. And at the bottom, we're told that the general OAR, to get the general non-production overheads, is 10% of the total product cost. And what we want to know, because we're talking about batch costing, is going to be what's the, what's the total profit on this, bat, on this uh, particular batch. So if we work from the bottom, The profit per unit 
as you can imagine, will be the sale price, take away the unit cost. The unit cost is the total batch cost divided by the batch size. Remember, we're dealing with identical units. So if you divide the total batch cost by the batch size, it'll give you the cost per unit. Now, how are we going to get this total batch size? Sorry, it's total batch cost. Well, remember, we just take the production cost and we add the general overheads. And general overheads are often a percentage of the production costs. And how do we, how do we find the um, production cost? Well, we simply add the prime cost and the production overhead. We've gone over that several times before. And how do you find the prime cost? Well, we add the direct material and the labor. So all of this is taking us towards finding the profit per unit or the profit per batch. You can, you can switch between the two simply by multiplying by the batch size. So in our example here, remember we were looking at this, so we have the direct material cost, we have the quantity, we have the um, sale price per unit, we have the general overhead absorption rate, and we have some details about the production center. So here you have your direct material costs. This is your labor. The labor is all added together, and that goes into there. And if you add that, that gives you what we call the prime cost. The prime cost is the total uh, direct costs. Then you need to add the overheads associated with the production. And again, we use the overhead absorption rates calculated for us here. And then if you add that, that will give you your total production cost. And again, production cost isn't enough. You now need to add the general overheads at 10% because we're told that the overheads are 10% of the production cost. So whatever it is we calculated here, we multiply that times 10%, add that, and that will give me my total batch cost. That's how much my batch cost me. Now, that batch was for 150 items. There, 150. So if I want to know how much each unit actually cost me, I need to divide by that 150. So that's my cost per unit. I'm selling these at 45 pounds per unit. So the difference, that is my profit. That's how much I'm actually making. After I've taken into account all the different aspects, labor, indirect production, and general overheads. Okay, so all of these costs have gone into that, and that is pure profit. Let's look at another example. Let's say we're an electronics company and we're producing um, uh, PCBs. And we have an order for 10 printed circuit boards at 400 pounds per unit. So we've got our three production centers and our OARs are given there. The question would be to calculate the unit cost. Okay, so we would hope that the unit cost would be less than 400 pounds, so that the difference would be our profit. But how would we actually calculate the, um, the uh, unit cost? So you'd follow the exact same state steps as we did in the previous um, example. So you add all these 
up, you add 10% for your overheads, you remember how many you have, so you, you divide the sum by 10, and that should give you your unit cost. So in this case, it's 386. So therefore, you would have a profit per unit of 400 minus 386. Okay, and then if you want to have your profit per batch, this is for the whole batch of 10 PCBs, then it's that times 10. Okay, so that was batch costing. Remember I said there are two types? Now we'll talk about continuous costing. Now for continuous costing, it's where you have more of a, um, a production line, like a conveyor belt. Well, what you're doing is you have a, a process. So something like drink manufacture or oil refining, but also for things like, um, uh, like hamburgers in um, the fast food industry. Now, we mentioned in several previous lectures that we are interested in cost analysis and um, uh, sorry, we're interested in cost analysis in order to make decisions. So these decisions are often short term for operational planning. And to make these decisions, we often want to know, are we making a profit? Or at what point are we making a profit? If we get a special order contract, should we fulfill or not? So asking ourselves these questions allows managers to make better informed decisions. Now, we often make distinctions in this module between different categories of, um, of, of costs. And we've mentioned before something called a variable and a fixed cost, but we haven't really spoken about it much. So we, we've, we've spoken about direct and indirect, but there's also a distinction we make between fixed and direct costs. So fixed costs don't change with levels of production. So things like your insurance, salaries. So not labor costs, but staff salaries. Rents and utility rates. So these things are fairly constant. They don't depend on production. Whereas your variable costs, they change depending on level of activity. So for example, your material costs. Right. So, again, if you go to um, uh, our example of uh, Greg's the Bakers, they have fixed costs in the form of their rent and insurance. That's constant whether or not they sell any sandwiches. But they also have variable costs. These, this is the cost of everything that they're actually making. So if you look at a graph of activity against cost, you have some things which don't change. Okay, this is your fixed costs. And you have some things, obviously, which do change. These are your variable costs. But your co total costs will be the sum. Because you have to pay these, and you have to pay these. So even if the business is producing nothing, and the uh, activity level is zero, you still have a fixed cost. And we often assume that this is a linear relationship. It doesn't have to be linear. It could be non-linear. But we're going to assume linear relationships. So 
So we're going to be looking at two different types of cost analysis. We're going to be looking at absorption costing and marginal costing. And the distinction between the two is whether or not we're looking at the fixed costs or the variable costs. Okay. So I'll give you an example which hopefully will illustrate this nicely. So let's look at the first example, which is absorption costing. In absorption costing, we look at both fixed and variable costs, no distinction, absolutely the same. And we make a decision based on a profit calculation. And the profit calculation is simply um, a, uh, a, a difference of how much something costs and how much it uh, makes. So, for example, if we have a company that's producing dash cams, okay, so this is our um, cost unit. Let's say we're producing 2,000 of these at 50, 000, uh, 50 pounds. So, um, multiplying the two will give you your sales income. So, that's how much we actually make. We make this multiplied by that. You have variable costs and fixed costs and overheads. So, how much of that £100,000 is pure profit? Well, it turns out only 25 k is profit because you have to take out the production costs and you have to subtract your overheads. So there's £25,000 profit and if you subtract the 25,000 pounds sorry if you divide the 25,000 pounds by 2000 that will give you your profit per unit now this made no distinction between variable costs and fixed costs we treated them as part of the same thing what we can do in something called marginal costing, is look only at the variable costs. So the fixed costs, we don't consider these to be absorbed into the production costs. So Let's look at the same example and see how we would we view the same, um, the same numbers um, under marginal costing. So under marginal costing, what we look at is something called a contribution. So how much is this sale contributing to our variable costs. So our marginal cost is 100% the variable cost. <clears throat> so we can calculate that easily. So every item produced generates income. The income generated must first pay for its marginal cost. What is left over after the marginal cost or the variable cost has been covered, that we call our contribution. So it's the sales income minus the marginal variable cost. So it's a contribution towards the fixed costs. And that gives us a more reliable decision-making tool. And I'll show you the same example. So this is our same dash cam example. Same numbers, when we used absorption costing a few minutes ago, we came up with a profit of 25,000. And now using marginal costing, the profit is still 25,000. We can't change that. That is the profit. But now what we're doing is we're only subtracting from the 100,000 the marginal cost. So the marginal cost here is... In this case, it's the sum of the 35 
and the 25. So that's your marginal cost. And then we consider that to be a contribution to the fixed cost. So you end up with the same profit, but calculated um, only by looking at your variable costs. Now, look, using marginal costing allows us to make um, better decisions. And let me give you an example. What we're often interested in is knowing how many units we need to sell to actually cover our original expenses. And that's important because by knowing this break-even point, as we call it, as a function of our units sold, it can allow us to determine the most uh, appropriate uh, sale point, i.e. the price point. It will allow us to determine um, the, um, uh, the optimum price. So when we speak about a break-even point, it's where we are no longer um, subsidizing this project or we're no longer at a loss. Okay, so we're neither at a loss nor making a profit. And again, we're using contribution, i.e. we're using marginal costing. Because unless you use marginal costing, um, you won't be able to um, uh, calculate this because if we were to use absorption costing, then you would add both of these together and you wouldn't have your relationship as a function of your uh, units produced. So the question is always how many units of contribution are required, not how long in time. Okay, How long in time, that's a totally different question. We call that payback period. Now we're talking about break-even points. The break-even point, we're interested in how many units. And what we're trying to cover is the fixed costs. Okay, that, that, that's what we often want to know. So our break-even point is the point at which the total operating cost is covered by the product sales income. Again, I'll remind you that our contribution is what's left over once variable costs have been paid. So if you think of our break-even point, is imagine a graph where we have our production, or number of units produced or sold. Actually, it's sold, not produced, against how much money we're making. So there are two lines here. You have your fixed costs and you have your variable costs. Okay, so here you have your fixed cost and here you have your variable cost. And when you add the two, that gives you your total cost. Separately, you'll have a line representing your revenues. That's how much money is coming in. And where the two lines intersect, at that point, your revenues will equal your total cost. That's called the break-even point, and that is how many items you need to sell. So the break-even point in units, and by, by units I mean by cost units. So this is how many actual units need to be sold in order 
to cover your costs. So it's the fixed costs divided by the difference between the selling price and the cost per unit. That's the formula we're going to use. So the same example, this is our dash cam example again. So we're talking about these dash cams. Remember we said we're making a profit of 25,000? So how many units do we need to sell to break even? So it's the fixed costs divided by the difference between the sale price per unit, 50 pounds, and the variable cost per unit. So I'll leave you to do the, um, the maths for that, but the answer is 750. So that means everything after the 750 units, because we're, we're making 2,000 of these, everything after the 750th unit is actually generating a profit. Another break-even uh, point calculation. Here we have this um, job sheet. We're told the fixed costs, we're told the variable costs, and we're told how many units we're making. Oh no, sorry, we're not told how many units we're making. We're given the costs and we need to find the break-even point. So the break-even point, that's how many units we would need to make in order to start making a profit. Okay, so if what, what you should be focusing on here is the variable cost. All right, so your variable cost, if you subtract that from your sale price, that is your contribution. You're only contributing two pounds for every unit. So how many two pounds do you need to contribute to cover the five million? So it's five million divided by two. And that's your two and a half million units. That is called your break-even point. Last thing I wanted to um, cover here is something called a special order contract. A special order contract is where you receive a sudden large order from a customer in addition to what is normally happening. So somebody might get in touch, a customer will get in touch and say, I want a special order. I want 100,000 of these um, manufactured and delivered. This isn't part of your regular production. And the manager needs to decide whether to accept this contract because all your costing will be based on regular production. And the, what the customer is offering is sometimes insufficient to cover the total cost of production. And it might appear unprofitable. So I, I've had this, uh, this scenario in, um, in, in real life in, in different occasions. You could go to a, you might be holding a party, you might go to a, uh, go to a takeaway and say, look, what I want is 200 sandwiches. 200 uh, kebabs and you're, what you're asking is for a special order you're asking for these 200 sandwiches that are in addition to what this shop would normally produce so they don't normally um, sell batches of 200 sandwiches so you're offering the manager a special order contract okay the sandwiches might normally cost three pound you're asking for a discount. You're saying, look, I'm going to, I want 200 sandwiches at £1.50. So the question for the manager is, should they agree? Should they offer 
this special order contract. The £1.50 is well below the normal selling price, but we need to decide whether or not this special order contract is profitable. So a more realistic example for electrical engineers is you're producing these PCBs. These PCBs are part of this dash cam that we're <coughs> we were talking about. So you normally have 100,000 units. That's your, your orders from your normal customers. A new customer comes along and asks for an additional 100,000 but is prepared to pay £1.40 per unit. You normally sell these for £3. So it's not too different from our sandwich example. So the 140 is less than the £3. And if you do the calculations here, the variable costs are £1, and the fixed costs are £1.50. Together, that's £2.50. So you're only making 50p per unit, okay? So your profit is only 50 pence per unit. So if you looked at this very simplistically, you'd say, look, I'm only making £2.50 per unit because... these PCBs are costing me £2.50. So you're offering me £1.40, so the answer is no. That is too low. Now that's, that's a simplistic um, view, and it's simplistic for several reasons. It's, the first reason is we haven't even taken this 100k into account. So no, we, would, we would have to put that in there and recalculate that. And therefore recalculate that. But even if we did that, even if we did that, so even if I were to add that 100k, that would still only bring my total, um, my unit price down by 10 pence. Oh, well, it will bring it down from £2.50 to £2.25. So I'm still making a loss of 85 pence. So the manager would still say, reject the order. That's what they would say, because it's not making sense. It's not profitable. And that's possibly what the sandwich shop owner will tell you. If they're selling something for three pounds and you're offering um, uh, one pound 40, if there's a special order, one pound 40, then it's very likely that they will reject. But what this doesn't take into account is the break-even point. Remember, we're talking about marginal costing. So we need to look at the contribution of this special order contract. So in this particular example, we're still talking about the same example. If we calculate the break-even point, if we divide our 750,000 by two pounds, our break-even point is 375,000 uh, units. So our normal output is 500,000 units a year. So we reach the break-even point easily within the year. So we've already covered our fixed costs. So the special order will contribute towards the profit. So even though it looks unprofitable, it actually is profitable. So if you look at it again, if we revisit this now, if you look at the £1.40, you don't need to subtract the, um, uh, the £1.50. All you need to, because that's all covered, the fixed costs are covered. All you need to do is look at the um, 
variable cost because the fixed costs have already been covered. So the only thing that matters is the one pound. And if you subtract one from 140, you're making 40p um, profit per item. And you, you've been asked for 100,000 of these. So it's 100,000 times 40p. And that's pure profit. So we should accept that contract. So even if something looks unprofitable to start with, a good manager will do this marginal cost analysis and will look at the break-even point and will determine whether or not something is profitable. So in the case of our sandwich shop, perhaps selling those 200 sandwiches at um, £1.50 would make uh, financial sense. So that brings us to the end of our lectures. So it's been seven lectures, some have been longer than others, but that is our final lecture. I do hope you found that um, helpful. It's been a learning curve for us all. I, I, I have learnt a lot about um, interacting in this new, strange, virtual environment where I don't get to, um, to, to meet you face to face. But I hope you found it uh, useful. As I said, this is the last lecture before your class test. Your class test is in the new year. Um, we will meet at the workshops between now and then. Um, it's been a pleasure teaching you and I'll take um, any questions you have in the workshop.